Please give a warm welcome to Isaac Schutt, and he's going to speak about Risk It for a Biscuit Linux on Risk Five. Cheers. Oh, I, I don't need a second microphone. There's one there. I'll be for question time. So I got a few questions I'm going to ask first. Uh, and you can hear I've got a velo, very uh, singing voice. That's because I'm from the city and we're noted for we sing, we don't talk. And when we get excited, we jump up two octaves. Right, so um, shower of hands. Where's everyone from? Where are you from? All right, so how many Americans have we here? Okay. All right. How many Europeans? Rest are European. So we got a Czech Republic. Anybody else? India. Poland, India. All right. Czech Republic. Czech Republic. Who's Ireland? Ireland, Mother Ireland. Ireland. Hey, hey. Up the rebels. Oh my God, we got a Carcone, a fellow Carconian here. I have to be very careful now because uh, everything I say will be fact-checked in the room. And over in the corner, 10 miles away, Panama. Ooh, Bono's got some money in the Panama accounts. I'm sure we'll all be interested to hear about that over a few pints. Uh, uh, anywhere else? South Africa. South Africa. Via Dublin. All right. Um, I'm just testing, uh, just seeing what my audience is here. Anybody here has done assembly programming? It's not mandatory. Actually, this is, I'm actually pleasantly surprised. That's kind of cool. Um, let's see. So if you've done assembly, then you know what an x86 and ARM processor are, right? All right, okay, good. And let's see, I'm assuming, I know there's a few hardware enablement people here. Hardware enablement? Linux hardware enablement? All right. Does anyone know what CISC, a CISC architecture is? Okay, we've got a nod, we've got a hand. I think it'll become explanatory when we go in. And here's a nice one. Here's an Irish one. And the Irish people, the, dub, the dubs need to know, tell me the answer to this one. Indianism. Anybody here know what Indianism is? Okay. Does any, uh, so, not as many as they expected. Do, so Indianism is about, if you take the 64-bit or 32-bit register or address space, and... Um, the CPU starts on the least significant bit to do its calculations with Little Indian and on the greatest bit, the highest bit, out for Big Indian. PowerPC traditionally used to be Big Indian until they changed about four or five years ago. And x86 for quite some time has been Little Indian. Um, I don't know how far back that went. But does anyone know where the word Indian that the, the, the term comes from. From? Hey, we got a winner, winner, chicken dinner. All right, you're gonna get this. This is my only prize. It's a pair of risk socks. I'm fashioning them today, and you know, you can see. I mean, I'm on the catwalk, right? Here's your, here's your risk five socks. Uh, indeed, the answer is the term Indianism came from Gulliver's Travels, and there's an Irish connection. Jonathan Swift was the Dean of St. Patrick's in Dublin, and he wrote Gulliver's Travels, right? Okay, and amazing that the term turns up here. Another one I should say is, does anybody know who George Boole is? All right, we'll teach you about George Boole in a second. All right, we're here, we're in Cork, so it would be uh, 
neglectful of me and my fellow Corkonian. What's your name? Aiden. Oliver Arfad Abuchel. That was a few Gaelic words. I mean, we're here. We might as well use it, right? So, forgive me the people that are 10 miles that way, but it seems the majority of people are here. Uh, these are Cork local places that you should try and visit while you're here. The English market is a wonderful covered uh, vegetables, uh, meat, market, fish, etc. Uh, Shandon is, if you look up the hill when you're downtown, you'll hear bells and you'll see it. It's worth a visit. You can go up to the top of it and you can actually ring the bells. They have um, the tunes written out in numbers so you can ring, ring tunes on the bells. Uh, the coal quay is a very famous outdoor trading spot, like a flea market, um, and has been there since before my dad was born, and my dad was born in 1930. Um, and you'll notice that it's coal quay, not coal quay. And when you go down to the water here, we don't call those quays, we call them keys. So uh, when uh, Paul Cormier and company call quay quay, they're mispronouncing the term, and that includes the guy that invented Quay. It actually is key, and it fits in right with um, the whole docker idea, because a key is where you dock a boat. Docker. Or should I say docker-like. <laughs> right? A lot of history there. Um, Murphy Stout. I know I'm, uh, we, got a, we got a bit of time. Murphy Stout is our equivalent here in Cork, uh, it's as good as Guinness, if not better, right? So have a pint of Murphy Stout. Uh, our favorite drink is Tanura. Isn't that right, Aiden? Yeah, I might have All right, he, he's, do you want to tell me you're a Beamish man? He, oh, Jesus, he drinks Beamish. Beamish is very, very uh, bitter, bitter, bitter. Kind of is. Barfies is just as good, if not better. <laughs> right. We'll have a revolution here in a minute now, the Dublin people against the Cork people. Um, so Tanora is a tangerine drink you can only get here in the, we call Cork the real capital of Ireland. It's a, an ongoing joke, but it is really the real capital. And uh, this is our coat of arms over here. All the best whiskies in Ireland are made in Cork, in Middleton. Um, Irish distilleries. Uh, that bottle there will set you back probably about 200 euros. And crunchy bars are my favorite crunchies, are my favorite chocolates. They're not exactly cork, but it's rock toffee. In actual fact, a crunchy bar is rock toffee. You could actually get rock toffee here years ago. And here is George Boole. I'm bringing it back, you see. So he was met it in the madness to quote the, the immortal bard. George Boole invented what? Bingo, Boolean algebra. And as we know, all those ones and zeros are the reason why we're sitting here, right? Which feeds back into the other thing called Indianism, etc. right? George Boole was English, uh, but he was the professor of mathematics in my local university here, University College Cork, my, my alma mater. And he had a townhouse in the city, which a friend of mine used to live in, so I've been in and out of that house, and it's been renovated. It's a beautiful house. And he had another house down in Black Rock. And what killed him? Literally, the Irish weather killed George Boole. I don't even think he was 50. He walked from the college one day to his house in Black Rock, which is probably about two and a half, three miles, maybe more. It rained, and it rained so bad. He got so wet, he caught a really bad cold, and it killed him. So, the founder of our Boolean algebra kicked the bucket because of the Irish weather. And the Irish weather is one of the reasons why I don't live here, because I can't stand the rain. Just like Tina Turner and a few other pop singers. I can't stand the rain. Uh, in the middle, is, the bottom is uh, the Cork coat of arms. And there are two castles, one at either side of the Lee, and, and the boat's coming up the middle. So it's a nautical town. And if you're not used to high tides, our tides here are more like uh, Canada. They're very, the low tide and the high tide, there's a huge difference. Any time of the year. Unlike in Hawaii, where it's like maybe three foot of a difference. Here, it's probably 25, 30 feet, maybe more, depending on the time of the year. 
Um, if anyone has problems understanding me, just, just kind of, you know the way you get someone to slow down? Just go like this. Because when I'm home, now that I'm home in my native surroundings, we talk really fast. You know, it's the whole little Indianism kicking in on steroids. All right, risk it for a biscuit. So, I'm the, so let me, let me uh, say who I am. My name is Isaac, last name is Shoot. It is a very uncommon name for anyone from the city. That's been honest. So I was uh, sticking out like a sore thumb from an early age. Um, I actually went back to college at a late age. I had gone to uh, university with a seminary, decided that I wasn't going to be a priest, and eventually went back to college and graduated here in Cork. I did computer science and Italian and loved every bit of it got into computers, and I remember there was one course in computer science that always resonated with me. And actually, Aidan, where did you go? Did you go to regional tech or to UCC? UCC on the ball. I don't know if you remember Johnny Vaughan. All right, so there was a professor up there, John Vaughan, and he used to do the 8086 architecture course. And if I look back in it, it was the only course that I still remember to this day, where we went into and we did some assembly. Uh, we went into the architecture itself, ALU, CPU, registers, pushing, pulling, blah, blah, blah. And it gave me appreciation, translation buffers, etc. cetera. Gave uh, virtual page memories, etc. cetera, paging out. Um, it gave me an appreciation for the complexity of the hardware. And I felt like, from a software engineering perspective, it was, it was like that Michelangelo moment where the two fingers meet in creation. And it was the electricity between the two fingers. That's the the hardware, where the hardware and the software come together, the rubber meets the road. And a lot of people um, have no appreciation for that space. Um, it's not really taught very well. And a lot of people, especially today, all our software layers are so abstracted away upstairs, very few people get to dabble deep down. And risk it for a biscuit, I have to explain the term for people that are not native English speakers, because I want to be cognizant of that. Um, I'm not a native English speaker, I'm a Corkonian. Get a, get a laugh out of Aiden now. Um, risking something for something better. So take a risk for a bigger reward. And risk five truly is uh, risking putting a bet on the table on something that's worth putting a bet on because it's going to pay off. And let's see. Okay, here's the complexity that we're faced with. Probably not, you, not what you thought would be the first slide. So for 11 years of my life, I managed the hardware enablement team, um, what we say a team of program managers that interfaced with all the silicon vendors, IO adapter vendors, graphics card vendors, NVIDIA, et cetera, Intel, AMD, ARM, the server vendors, so the HPs, the Dells, et cetera, and trying to figure out how do you enable RHEL, Linux, sitting on these multitude of adapters and hardware componentry, and how do you light them up and bring them into the fold? Um, so that was an interesting challenge, because at the end of the day, you know, it's great that we all have our favorite little part of the equation that we play in, but without um, a healthy software ecosystem, or applications that do work that customers actually need to do the work and solve the problems that they have, no matter what we architect or what solution we create, it's actually, it's irrelevant if it's the best solution on the planet and there's very few applications running on it. So from the get-go, we're kind of, Looking at risk five, and this is one of the reasons I was hired, to, you know, how do we have the most vibrant, healthy, and healthiest um, hardware ecosystem and software ecosystem enabled for our customers? So the customers have choice, and, and it, it's a challenge. Um, I have my own, oh, this has been recorded, so I have my own thoughts on some of the past history of events, so I'm not going to malign some of the guilty parties, but we've all learned lessons through our former silicon enablement relationships that will help us do things better this time around, I'm hoping. Um, all right. 
So this is just a very quick recap for risk versus CISC. So the risk in risk five really stands for reduced instruction set computing. ARM chips are risk chips. Um, digital Unix used to run on alpha. That was a risk chip, PA risk. Um, so there's, then you've got CISC, which is complex instruction set computing, Intel x86. And the primary difference really is that as you do a cycle in the CPU per clock cycle, a risk machine would execute one instruction per cycle, whereas a CISC processor would actually take a few cycles to complete an operation. Um, I'm sure we could get some zealots from Intel that would probably disembowel me and say, you're completely wrong for this reason, this reason, this reason. But the fact is that, as a result, risk is a little bit from performance better. Uh, performance perspective, right? So risk five, yeah, there was a risk one, risk two, three, four, and now we've risk five. And one would say, well, so what? Well, it's big so what. Risk five, and for the non-native English speaking people, so V is the Roman numeral for five, and we just say risk five as opposed to risk V. Um, this is about as close as you can get to open source hardware from the perspective of open source CPUs, which is, it can be misinterpreted. So remember, open source is free, free access to stuff that you can do something meaningful with, but it, it's not like free beer, right? You've heard like free speech versus free beer. The fact is that we have an ISA, so it's um, the specification itself for how a RISC-V chip should behave and operate is available for free. And you don't even need to be a member of the RISC-V International Foundation in order to create a RISC-V chip that's RISC-V compliant as long as you adhere to the specification itself. Now, if you want to uh, help evolve the technology and help evolve the specifications, then you become a member of the organization. Uh, from a company perspective, you know, Red Hat's already a member, the, all the big wigs are members. Uh, you could, you know, and, and that costs a few bob, but we leave that up to the CFOs in these companies and the CTOs, they can make that decision. From a personal perspective, there's nothing stopping anyone being a member uh, on a personal account basis. So it's, it's an open source community in, from that perspective. And people can help correct, people can have suggestions, etc. And so unlike x86 and ARM and all those many, uh, we say, I won't say fails, but historical uh, sunset um, CPU chipsets and chipsets, um, they had closed source ISAs, so you would have to pay a license to get access to the design. Now, Sun Solaris, I will have to give an honorable mention because our CF, CTO is, used to be at Sun, they open sourced all that jazz as well at one point. So this is where, so risk five, ah, so if a member, um, can a member create something that's closed source for them to use? So in theory, you can have your own private extension that you would use. But then that's the, the onus is on you then to support that and you need to get an operating system vendor to support that extension as well, right? From an embedded perspective, of course, you can do whatever you want. It's all self-support anyway. Uh, great question. All right. So again, if you were to go to ARM to, tomorrow and say, hey, I want to change the design. I want you to change this and change that. They'd say, I don't know if they'll do a private contract with you and do that change, 
are, but it's going to cost you a lot of money just for the privilege. With Risk V, that whole specification is free and open. So, again, here's where the free and open versus expense. If you if you're going to try and create a chip based off the specification and adhere to specification, of course you're going to have to have the infrastructure to do that, and you're going to have to have a contract with a fab, unless you've got a fab in your back pocket, which very few people have, uh, other than Intel and you know uh, TSM, etc. So the expense of making the chip is still there. So there's you know there's no free lunch in some respects. Yes, the the code is available, the, the, the descriptions available, the specifications available, just like open source code. But when you start to create a product, there are expenses associated with creating the product. But still, it's a lot cheaper to create with this new architecture than it is with historical architectures because you have such an overhead with regard to how much the tech, the IP is going to cost you up front to begin with. All right, so there's the concept of ratified specifications and then there's continuous ev evolution where we have the specification continues to evolve, right? So we've got two primary specifications. One is, think of it as the unprivileged specification is for, you know, user mode applications. And then you've got the privileged specification, which is for machine mode, uh, supervisor mode, such as operating systems need, and hypervisor ISA, things like that. And of course, the privilege specification inherits a lot of the stuff that's already in the, the first spec to begin with. And there is a link in there. I will make these slides available uh, so you can see that there's actually another uh, deck available with regard to the unratified specifications. And Will I say this on camera? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Raf it's a very long, slow process to ratify a specification. But, you know, people collaborate, create a specification around a specific thing. And then there's a window where that's publicly reviewed. And then it's frozen. And then that makes its way into the specification. Hey, this is the latest version of the spec. Uh, and then, of course, there's another variant that's going to be, hey, we're, we're now working on these other things. So I'm going to hit the, hit, the, hit the dying horse here. Open standards and collaboration. I mean, open, 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 open. Just like open source software, this is open. Open. And last time I looked, the Linux Foundation was a pretty open organization and place to work which is kind of cool. However, here's the kicker. So, for those of us here that are not American, a lot of countries are kind of sick and tired of being beholden to America because it's got the crown jewels of technology and IP for technology. And countries like China, countries like India, which is a pretty big country, uh, Brazil, the European community, they want to have choice and technology choice, and they don't want to be completely dependent on an American multinational for that choice, right? So as a result, this geographical kind of diversity aspect bleeds into the RISC-V equation where all these entities are extremely interested in RISC-V enablement, which is really cool. Uh, we're on a voyage that it's pretty unique. Um, and to prove our neutrality, the RISC-V Foundation is actually registered in uh, Switzerland these days. I won't give you my private Id ideas on, uh, around Switzerland and neutrality. I've got some uh, <clears throat> interesting ones for over a pint. Uh, let's see. I'm going to check the time. All right. This is stuff we can read. So you've got the European community. We've even got Intel. Did ARM have Intel when they were trying to enable their technology? They were trying to do enterprise servers? No, they didn't. In actual fact, there was a lot of uh, friction, let's say, in the community and elsewhere. So we've got Intel. Intel, so I'll give kudos to Pat Gelsinger. 
Um, and actually, I met Cal Pat Gelsinger one day. It was the day he, after he was hired at uh, EMC. I um, bumped into him at the coffee station and I had coffee with him. Um, really nice guy. But I did find it peculiar that he still had on his website at that stage that his desire in life was to be the CEO of Intel. I guess he got his wish. So Pat has decided to kind of make separate divisions with Intel and have Intel also be the foundry of choice for chip vendors. So that if you're a startup, you can actually get Intel to create your chips, whatever shape or form. But they're big into helping enable the RISC-V market, which is cool, right? Um, there's a little thing here about España. España, por favor, ellos, they, are very much interested in this um, technology as well, as is Brazil, others. There's another project called RISE, and that's helping focus energy across multiple comp uh, companies across the industry to enable the software ecosystem and accelerate the adoption of RISC-V, which is great. So we, we've got a lot of wind in our sails, so to speak. Um, I think you can read this one. This is more of an architecture slide. I'll get killed for saying that, I'm sure. And like the open standards is a big thing for us. Tool chain, tool chain is interesting. So when it comes to compilers and it comes to debuggers um, and, and libraries and tool, tooling in general on the tool chain side, they actually need to be enabled with the extensions for RISC-V in order for that extension to be supported. So it's kind of interesting that it's not just the operating system supports the chip, it's like the tool chain itself, all the individual components of the tool chain have to be able to support the individual components of the technology in order for the operating system then in turn to take advantage of um, various extensions. So there's a, as you can imagine, there's a multitude of extensions. So there's a multitude of timelines associated with each of those extensions. Some are frozen, some are already supported, some are about to be supported, for instance, in GCC. And we're kind of, I'm actively tracking them and other people as well to see, you know, okay, where are the gaps and how can we accelerate this? This is an, a really cool slide. I'm not, not a fan of architecture at times, but sometimes you get one and you go like, wow, gee whiz, Batman, this one catches the imagination. So if you look at the graphic and you look at the projection, they're projecting at the end of 2025 nearly 80 billion RISC-V cores shipped. That is phenomenal. It's, 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 it's daunting. Now, of course, when it comes to enterprise computing, you know, this is like the t this is the edge of the iceberg, because they're starting with RISC-V in embedded type devices, small edge type devices, and then kind of bleeding into bigger and bigger and bigger as you come up the kind of hardware stack. The, um, some performance benchmarking material, of course, performance is an important thing, and I would be what is it negligent are even misleading if I actually said, hey, you know, we're the best performing thing on the planet. Um, we're getting there. That's what I can say. We're getting there. And I've, given my experience with ARM enablement in the enterprise compute space, I believe we're about five years ahead of where ARM was at this moment in its evolution within the enterprise compute space, which is, again, an interesting moment in time. This is a lovely slide, <laughs> lots of partners, lots of software partners, application vendors, runtimes, operating systems that are interested, kicking the tires. Debian came out the other day saying they officially support RISC-V as, a, as um, an architecture. Uh, Ubuntu already officially supported as well, Canonical. Um, of course, we've got Fedora support as well, and over time, as boxes start to come along with these CPUs in them, enterprise servers, then it's the natural evolution is that RHEL, well, Fedora, then sent our stream and then into RHEL as we continue to kind of make progress. And likewise with OpenSUSE, likewise with Alma Linux, 
uh, etc. Uh, hypervisor support, extremely important. And I would add that, like from my perspective, the sweet spot is when will, and this is the question I'm sure Troy and others are asking, when will the technology be ready for enterprise compute? And, and it's a kind of a chicken and egg, because it's like, when will the CPUs be ready? When will the box vendors such as HP and Amazon and NVIDIA and others be ready? And what's that kind of moment in time where it all intersects? And, and you don't want to start the work of enablement at that moment in time. You want to start to maybe three years ahead of that, which is why I'm standing here in front of you today. All right. Um, not a good slide. There's a risk membership link here if your company wants to join the Risk Foundation, the Risk Five Foundation. Um, there's some more information in there as well. And extensions. So here's a concept. So the only real mandatory extension is the integer extension. You know, can you add, can you subtract, etc. Everything else has to be kind of an additional extension. So there's a multiplication integer multiplication and division, M, the atomics, A, uh, you got the various floating points, uh, F, D, um, and actually there was, there was a quad floating point somewhere, it's on, a, it's on a different slide, and then there's compression, etc. These extensions are what add, which they extend the ability of this, the CPU itself, the SOC, to do additional things. And in theory, you can have a multitude of chip designs that will just do very basic stuff to very complex stuff, uh, including all the memory management that we're used to uh, at the high end from an enterprise compute perspective. But the fact is that you can actually design chips to do all of this uh, very little or a lot. So you can imagine you can have customizable chips. We're not expecting RHEL to be running, or Fedora to be running on those custom, heavily customized chips with reduced instruction sets, et cetera. Um, that wouldn't make much sense, and there wouldn't be much of a, a business case for that. However, we will expect all the distros, not expect, we hope, and we, we petition and, and, and request that all the, the main Linux distributions work with us in enabling RISC-V. Um, there are distros sitting on Risk v Of course, some of that is the working upstream with the Linux community itself, and then um, have the platform available so that the box vendors can consume it, and the kind of the whole ecosystem starts to build out. A little word on profiles. If you're not up to speed on profiles, it can be a little confusing. And the one I draw attraction here to is our last major profile was really. RVA20, and we're talking 64-bit, not 32-bit. And we add in additional extensions as they get ratified over time. Hence, you got RVA22, 23. So there's additional things that kind of come in with the new uh, specifications and once things become hardened and available. And then, of course, the future, there is a RV128. Not sure how far out that is in the, in the event horizon. Oh, and more importantly, let me see. Go back here. There's a link here to a great profile document on GitHub. If you want to overindulge yourself and if you need to sleep some night, you've got insomnia. Um, and then, of course, we've got the, the hardware platform definitions uh, for Risk V, that work is starting this year, and, and that will start to kind of evolve. That is probably something that will be really interesting to the folks within the distro space. Right, this is the decoder ring. You're going to see many variations of this, but for all intents and purposes, you've got RV is Risk V. Um, the second or the third digit here can be an integer I or A application. Uh, the 23 is the year, so it could be 20, 22, 23. Uh, U, um, that one is, can be privileged. The privilege mode itself is it user, is it supervisor? And then, of course, at the end, you've got 64. 
So you will see some of these names with 32 at the end. Um, you're not going to be interested in that, but the 64, yes, and RVA 20 S 64 is probably the one that's of most interest right now from a Linux distribution perspective. And as we get to ratification and evolution at some point, it's probably be 20, that RVA 24 will probably be the next one that will be uh, of um, similar importance. And again, so I didn't want to use the poster that they had in World War I for recruiting troops. We need, I need you. But we need you as part of the community and the extended community to help us enable the ecosystem. And the ecosystem is pretty complicated. Um, on the one hand, we have the tool chain, which in itself is a pretty complicated world and has to be enabled for RISC-V. On the other hand, and a lot of the tool chain is available, so GCC and the debuggers, uh, LLVM, etc., they're all available today and they're all enabled. And there's some residual work that still needs to be done, but the good news is the work is getting done. Um, however, then you look at it, it's like, okay, I'm a customer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention probably a customer, uh, a partner whose, whose name may not be appreciated, but for instance, Oracle, right? Oracle is a pretty important player in the database space. And it's like, well, Isaac, when is Larry going to actually trust you to put his stuff on it? Well, you got this whole stack here, and we got to have the stack in place. So we need, so you got the socks themselves. Who are the sock vendors that are going to be creating enterprise socks? Who are the box vendors that are going to be consuming these socks? Then you've got, IO adapters, yeah, you can have probably ARM adapters, x86 adapters, but you're going to have native adapters as well, and upstream drivers, and box drivers, etc. And then, of course, you've got the most important part of the equation, where are the operating systems? And, of course, when you think of operating systems today, you're thinking of, what about VMware? What about the hypervisors? Hyper-V. What about AWS? What about uh, Alibaba? Um, what about all the major regional hypervisor players? And then, of course, you've got, what about all the Kubernetes distro vendors? So OpenShift, uh, Docker, and uh, everybody else. So that all needs to be coordinated carefully so that we can kind of, from a cross-community, cross-company perspective, enable the architecture so that Larry and others, Larry's customers, can actually fully um, embrace and adopt the technology. It's not going to happen overnight. We have to crawl, walk, run. Uh, but the good news is that we're well on the way, and we definitely have the wind behind our, our sails right now. And there's, a, you know, as I said, I feel like we're five years ahead of where ARM was at this point. And I couldn't tell you where we're going to leapfrog ARM from a technological perspective, but we're, you know, it is going to happen. Um, and it's a pretty exciting space, but we definitely need the Linux community's help. I mean, and again, RISC-V Foundation is part of the Linux Foundation. And, you know, we want to give customers choice of platform, choice of solutions, um, give partners choices, and help enable a more competitive uh, architectural landscape. So, let's see. This is just the life cycle thing. We kind of touched on that earlier. And for anyone that really loves eye charts, this one is the best one I've ever seen. It's the RISC-V reference card. This gets into the arithmetic, um, stores, loads, uh, you know, how memory, memory management, um, and a whole load of other stuff, which is fascinating probably for John Masters, Redbeard, and, and, and a few other people, but for plebs like myself, um, probably a little bit too much. Um, there was a song back in the eight, late 80s, it was called The Future So Bright I Gotta Wear Shades. Um, if I was in a country where the sun was shining, apparently global warming is making it the warmest time of the year. 
the warmest July on record in, most, in the planet in most countries. Well, Ireland just had the wettest, so there's no point in wearing sunglasses. Um, but the future is so bright, I've got to wear shades. Risk V is going to grow up into all these environments that we've known and loved for so long. And we rely on everyone's assistance and help from a community perspective to help uh, bring this out into the open to birth this technology. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to working with everyone on it. So, any questions? No, I didn't say what languages I was going to respond in. Okay. Uh, okay, I have a lot of questions, actually. Uh, the first one is, uh, you told us about uh, risk being well performant. I won't argue, but uh, what about the power efficiency? I mean, I mean, you know, the, because when we calculate a lot of things, we calculate in the long term how much power it will consume. So do you have any benchmarks uh, like power, like instruction per watt or um, this kind of be benchmark, you know. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure there are, and you're going to give me your name and your email, and I'm, I'm going to get you the data because I don't have it off the top of my head. Because, you know, our intent is to be as competitive on the power envelope front as ARM is today. Okay. And power in green is kind of an interesting one because, for instance, even the high-end CPUs from AMD today, they consume a lot more energy but because you need a lot less of them to do your work, you've gone from two racks of systems to a half a rack of system consuming less power. So the, the power equation, depending on who's writing the, blue, the, the, the white paper, uh, can be misleading, but our intent is that it's going to be as competitive uh, and competitive with ARM's power envelopes. Okay, so sorry, it's called performance per yeah. watt. Uh, the other thing is that uh, Linus, Thor was actually said that I'm, I agree with him that in order to get uh, the new architecture, we're going to speak it to become uh, very competitive, you need the developers to have the boxes. Yes. Uh, and I totally agree with him. For me personally, uh, I started using ARM as my workstation by, because Apple created the Macs. Mm -hmm. And then it was much easier than spin something on AWS or whatever, or use Raspberry Pi that, well, sorry, it's not good enough for serious work when you compile a lot of things. So do you know any workstation for developers with RISC-5 that you can recommend or say that there, it is? I have very same problem with PowerPC because there is like the tables or something like that, I, don't, I might... Uh, yeah, set so, tables and getting it, you know, uh, was very hard with ARM even, but it's very popular. I waited like the half year to get the proper equipment and how it looks when it comes to the risk. Yeah, so, so those offerings are, are coming from partners, right? And I, I'm not aware of the roadmaps, but I do know that, for instance, there, there has been a laptop that has been shipped with a RISC-V chip in it already which is, uh, says a lot in itself. Actually, I'm curious, how many people do we have online right now? Because um, I'm wondering if there's some of the partners online, if, they, if, they, if someone's monitoring that, uh, they may have an answer, and uh, I can repeat it once, once we have the answer in, okay? Because I know there were partners on this morning when I asked. Uh, any more questions? No, thank you. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, all right. We're doing the microphone. Ah, so a couple of cases ago, fresh one. So the 16-bit compressed instructions, it's like ARM's uh, sum, right? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. So uh, you were talking about an extension for 16-bit compressed instructions. It's an equivalent of ARM's uh, sum feature, right? Or the compress, yes. And uh, a more practical question about uh, well, helping RISC Five. Uh, so, suppose I compile uh, the binaries of my project uh, for X5, and uh, it doesn't exactly work as uh, I expect. So, what's the best course of action uh, to find out why right now? Be because there's, there are so many possibilities now that it's, uh, uh, the whole stack is still a bit experimental in compilers, uh, in the Linux kernel, and so on. I would be lying to say I have an answer for that question. 
So we have people on the team that look, that look after that side of things, and you're going to give me your name, and, and I'm going to follow up. Okay? You got my word. The lady second. in the back? Sorry. Because I certainly won't be devoting it with you. <laughs> I wish I could. What boards do you recommend for like Risk Five development? Like single board computers or like an FPGA? All right. So privately, I could recommend boards, but because we've we got to be partner agnostic, I kind of have to leave that up to people to choose from the existing ones that are available. And I'm not being flippant. It's uh, it's just like. I have to love all my children equally. Uh, I love SUSE, I love RHEL, I love Fedora, I love Ubuntu, right? So, I, and I, I, can't, I can't suggest one over the other or choose one over the other. Come on. You must have a favorite child. <laughs> What's my favorite child? Yeah. Um, if you want to play around, there's some milk boards available. So. Yeah. I'm just going to search it up. Okay. <laughs> and I'm doing this one handed. Someone's else. Tomash. We've got this chap here waiting patiently. Thank you. Um, I think I noticed that on one of the slides, but um, I have a question. Is, is, are there any extensions? coming up from being ratified uh, to accelerate cryptographic? Uh, yes, type. vector crypto. And what about uh, post-quantum cryptography? Um, that one I'd have to check. But vector crypto has been heavily worked on right now. OK, thank you. Hi. Um, first of all, great talk, so thank you for giving it. And um, for my question, I, I thought it was really interesting, kind of the membership of uh, various, you know, countries or, or organizations across the world within Risk Five. Um, when you talked about kind of, I don't know a better way to say it's like democratizing access to developing hardware, mm -hmm. which is predominantly or at least historically been in the U.S. Uh, when thinking about these partners, are there specific sort of applications that they are uh, looking into developing using RISC-V? Is it more about you know, creating more consumer-oriented devices that they have control over the manufacturing pipeline, or is it more around like servers and stuff like that? I was wondering if you just, if I, th you know. it's, I think it's more from a government perspective, and you, know, you think a lot of governments are like one big, huge company and they have to you know, purchase a lot of systems and they want to have the choice and they don't want to be totally dependent on one specific geo for the technology. You can imagine it's a bit like, I mean, oil and, and the Arab countries and, and the US is, is a similar uh, conundrum and, and Russia. Um, where a, com a country like Ireland, for instance, we don't have any oil. It costs us an arm and a leg to get it. And we're dependent on all those countries. So, you know, from a technology perspective, it's a similar analogy where having the ability to, having companies in your own geo that have the technology in the geo, that they're not dependent on um, somebody in, in Redmond or Seattle or Silicon Valley for. Yeah. Choice is always good. Choice and open, they're my two favorite words. So how far is the development of uh, PCIe-based extension devices, um, things like sound cards, um, graphics devices, has come for this instruction set? It's a work in progress. Uh, and it's an extremely important part of the equation, right? Exactly. Okay. Dubliner? Hi, sorry, it's probably a stupid question, but... No such thing. Like, what level of technology regarding the chip manufacturers does this actually need? Like, are you still relying on, like, Taiwan Semiconductor, or...? Unless you've got a few billion dollars to create a fab, you are. Uh, but you've got to remember, like, Taiwan Semiconductor, they now own... I know it's like 75% of those new lithographic machines that come out of that company in Holland. 
And Intel has a ton on back order, but they have nowhere near the same amount of systems. Um, for anyone that's interested, yeah, you should look it up. The, I can't remember the name of that company in Holland, but it's, it's almost like a photocopier with gas. That's the best way I can describe it. And it's able to you know, create the blueprint on, on the, um, the silicon, uh, and they can do several layers and layer on top of it, which is just mind-boggling. Oh, the gas comes from Russia. I, I think it comes from Dial Aaron. That's actually a local joke. That's our, that, there are politicians, a lot of hot gas, a lot of hot gas, like every other country. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, so regarding PCI Express and so on, uh, uh, is it a standard uh, uh, like reference design of a South Bridge uh, uh, right now or, no, or not? Sorry, you're gonna have to repeat, I apologize. Uh, is there a standard design for a South Bridge uh, for RISC-5? South Bridge? Yeah. Um, sound Bridge. South. South. South, South. South Bridge. Uh, that one I'd have to look into, I don't know. That's been honest. Oh, we got another one from the Yellow Submarine. Uh, okay, last Chesh. question. Chest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay, so I had a problem, for example, that uh, I needed a virtualization on ARM, and it came with one of a version, like 8.5 or something like that. It doesn't matter. How do, do, because right now I believe that there is no necessary virtualization risk. If it will be, how would it look like, and when I can, how can I check if there is some this kind of extension or if it's in pipeline? You mean the hypervisor extension? Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, but you have a hypervisor extension, but this is like the first layer of virtualization in most cases. Mm -hmm. and, but I need the second layer, and because, and I like yeah. so, you know to have a virtualize, virtualize, virtualize VMs on VMs on VMs and things like that. Nested, and nested virtualization. Yeah, exactly. Which I don't think RHEL actually supports the data. Neither does um, Rev. Uh, so there are two virtualization theorems, uh, and if the extension is compliant with those theorems, I can show you later. Then nested virtualization is uh, perfectly doable, and uh, actually KVM inside KVM, uh, at least in some cases, it works. But on risk five, it's a, of course the question for the risk five team. <laughs> All right, cool. And ARM isn't quite there yet on, on, on uh, virtualization. So the intent would be that we're going to leapfrog ARM probably um, on virtualization. Okay, last question. Anybody over here? All right, so just to finish, I'm just going to give you a, a quick bar. I'm a former opera singer. And this is our local song. Oh, how oft do my dreams in their fancy take flight To the home of my childhood away To the day when each patriot's vision seemed right Ere I thought that those days would decay When my heart was as light as the wild winds that blow Down the marlake to each elm tree where we sported and played neat the green leafy shade on the banks of my own lovely lea where we sported and played neat the green leafy shade on the banks of my own lovely lea up the runners and that's, that's a song about our river, the river down here, the banks of our river. We love our town. All right, thanks, folks. Um, those of you that I want to get names off of, names, badges, and serial numbers, uh, I'm going <laughs> to just come over here, and we're going to write it down, all right? Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. So we have next session coming up in four minutes.